prison. Something as an Australian I'm actually rather qualified to talk about. And despite all the discourse around them and the myriad of laws that can land you in one, there are really only two reasons you end up in prison. You either do something incredibly bad or incredibly based, and there is no in between. There is a difference between murder and tax evasion, unless the man you killed is named Andrew Tate or the director of the IRS, in which case we need to talk about getting you time off for good behaviour. But regardless of circumstances, prison is not a nice place to be no matter where you end up. They barely feed you, they work you to death for no money, it costs hundreds if not thousands of dollars to call your family back home due to the corporation that runs it, and all the while they keep telling you that the hours and hours of education and seminars and courses that you attend inside are really going to help you when you get out and reintegrate into society. Oh, and uh, while we're on that subject, this is a quick reminder to all my younger American viewers, please text that recruiter back, they work really hard, and they just want to talk to you about your college and healthcare options from their sponsor General Dynamic. <laughs> Suffice to say, naturally, the first priority of 99% of prisoners is getting out, and sometimes, either due to a life sentence or impatience, they need to take matters into their own hands. And over the years, there have been some truly spectacular prison escapes. The most famous example, of course, being the 1962 Alcatraz escape. The fate of the escapees remains unknown, but the Mythbusters proved that they could have done it. There was also that one guy in Japan who got so good at busting out, he escaped maximum security prison no less than four different times, with nothing more than a bowl of miso soup and a dream. And look, we all know the Japanese work ethic is crazy, but even by their standards, that man was, I think as the youth say, hashtag built different. And yet among all these crazy escapes, all of the insanity that criminals from around the world have pulled, some of them may have been ingenious, some of them may have been extreme, but none of them, none of them can claim the most spectacular escape. And the reason is actually quite simple, because none of them had access to an air force. Peasants. That's right, we are travelling back in time to 1944. In occupied France, the Allies are preparing to launch D-Day, the Germans are building cruise missiles to decimate London, but all the while, a secret war between the French Resistance and the Gestapo is raging, and locked inside Amiens prison, Resistance leaders face torture and execution for the information they carry, which could compromise both their resistance networks and the upcoming Allied plans. Something had to be done. This is history's greatest jailbreak. Mission codenamed Ramrod 564, or, as it became known later, Operation Jericho. And long live Santa Fe, Patria de Dogoy Estaris, La Tonu de la Trine. I can't speak French. Why the hell am I trying to do this? Seriously, I'm half English, half German. My ancestors are rolling in their graves. I'm not even going to try and do this. Uh, yeah, let's just continue the video. Throughout 1943 into 1944, the Allies had been working with various resistance groups in northeastern France with a focus on gathering intelligence about the Atlantic Wall coastal defences and the German forces in the Pas de Calais region. Operation Overlord, the invasion to liberate Europe, known more commonly as D-Day, had been in planning for over a year and was scheduled to launch in a few months' time in Normandy. Resistance was intended to play a crucial role in the invasion by disrupting German reinforcements and resupply operations, hopefully delaying their advance to the beaches long enough for the Allies to get enough forces ashore to repel and then destroy them. Resistance groups in northeastern France were to conduct aggressive operations to aid in this effort while aiming to convince the Germans that the Normandy landings were a feint to distract them from the expected, quote, real landings, end quote, at Calais, which is of course the shortest and safest route across the English Channel. And so obviously the Allies would land there because the Allies never take risks, so of course they're going to cross the shortest part of the Channel, right? It's obvious. Spoiler alert, this actually ended up working, because throughout the entirety of World War II, the Germans never worked out that the enemy doesn't actually do what you want them to do. Or, that even crazier, they may in fact be lying to you or using misinformation. Just ask all those poor bastards freezing their balls off in Norway preparing for an invasion that's definitely going to happen. Not to mention all those other divisions in Greece for the same reason. That and they were sent there to get their money back because, you know, the EU. Where is our money, Schweinhunds? Europe gave you a loan and now you have repairs with your lives! 
There was also a large contingent of Allied operatives and resistance fighters investigating, gathering intelligence on, and attempting to disrupt the vengeance weapon operations taking place in the region as the Germans were preparing to deploy the V-1 cruise missile and the V-2 ballistic missile against Britain later in the year. Simply put, resistance operations in France were of vital importance to the Allies in support of the invasion, and both the number of resistance cells as well as the intensity of their activity was increasing exponentially. However, as with all underground operations, the more frequent and widespread it becomes, the less covert it is, resulting in far higher risk of being compromised, which of course, is exactly what happened. Hello, what is up, my fellow friends, Kameraden? Have you seen this Hitler guy? Ach, what a loser! You fine gentlemen have got a plan to do something about him, nein? Yeah? The chief of the German counterintelligence service in northern France, the Abwehr as it was known, was a man named Hermann Giskes, who was also in charge of handling the Low Countries, that being Holland and Belgium. And he had presided over some of the most successful clandestine operations conducted by Nazi Germany during World War II, including the capture and subsequent execution of over 50 SOE agents in the Netherlands. The success of Operation Englandspiel, as it had been called, prevented the Dutch resistance from getting any weapons from the Allies and successfully organising, which would later prove seriously difficult and would even contribute to the failure of Operation Market Garden, the effort to liberate Holland in September of that year. This was the man responsible for protecting the secrecy of the V-weapons installations and curbing resistance efforts for the expected upcoming invasion. He succeeded in building a network of informants all throughout northeastern France, infiltrating the resistance's highest levels until on February 14th, 1944, he sprung his trap. What amounted to the entire senior leadership of the region's resistance leaders were arrested in one vicious sweep, decapitating the organization at a crucial moment. However, the real problem was the capture of one prisoner in particular, Raymond Vivant. He was one of the senior members of the biggest resistance movement in northern France, the Organisation Civile et Militaire. Now, while resistance groups often operated separately in individual cells, mitigating the risk of compromise, Raymond Vivant was the man who originally set up all the communications networks for those cells in the first place. And as such, he knew everyone, everywhere, and how they operated. He knew the plans for the expansion of the resistance throughout all of France, and most dangerously of all, he knew almost the entire plan for resistance operations in support of Overlord in this region. And as the saying famously goes, the Gestapo have ways of making you talk. And despite what the movies tell you, the fact remains, you will break eventually. Everyone does. The resistance leaders, their operatives, and a number of allied spies caught up in the intelligence sweep were incarcerated at Amiens prison. Given the dire nature of these circumstances, news was quickly smuggled out of the prison and spread to the resistance groups in the area which had managed to avoid the roundup, who then sent the message to London, informing them that their spies and the most important members of the resistance in northern France had been captured and were awaiting interrogation. Upon receiving the reports, Allied Intelligence's reaction was, well, to be expected. Oh, Fuck! On a scale of 1 to Detroit, the oh shit meter was broken into little pieces and covered in it. We aren't up shit creek anymore, we aren't even up Shice Canal, we are on Lake Michigan in a paddle steamer and the paddles on this steamer are the fan the shit has just collided with. This was that bad. Bad enough that both the American and British intelligence services were in full agreement with each other for the very first time on literally anything. The guys locked up in Amiens prison cannot be allowed to talk under any circumstances. If they do, we are so royally fornicated, D-Day won't be an amphibious landing, with no marines. It will be a tag on Orange YouTube for an entirely different reason than it already is. We need to get them out, like right the hell now. Or we need to take more, uh, direct methods of solving the problem. And so the order went out to the remaining operatives in the area to gather as much intelligence on the prison as possible. Yesterday. Which they quickly did. However, the portents they observed were rather grim. 
The prison was maximum security. Separate courtyards for different cell blocks, 11 foot high walls of considerable thickness and reinforced cells. Overcrowding was an issue as well, given that there were over 800 prisoners crammed inside, plus a detachment of almost 200 guards, complete with anti-aircraft defences and a machine gun post watching the main yard. What was worse is that the intelligence teams, sent out to case the prison, couldn't verify the thickness of the walls or the exact location of the defences. And when they tried smuggling out documents relating the information on the prison they did manage to get, one of the agents carrying a portion of the intel was caught and executed resulting in the Gestapo seizing his documents and then increasing security to high alert, reinforcing the garrison. Things were not going well. But there was one ray of hope. One of the resistance operatives had stolen the blueprints for the prison, while another had managed to get authorization to bring food and necessities to the lower security prisoners. And while doing this, they were able to locate where in the prison the high value targets were kept, along with the political prisoners and the spies locked up in solitary confinement. They also managed to get the location of the guardhouse, the guards quarters, and most crucially of all, the prison's daily schedule. Both the prisoners and the guards had lunch at midday. With the exception of the guards on duty and the prisoners in solitary, the guards would all be in their areas eating, while the prisoners would either already be out of their cells eating themselves, or getting ready to leave their cells to go to lunch. Furthermore, there were several senior prisoners on the inside in contact with the courier bringing in the food and essentials who could spread the word of a breakout attempt, with some even getting themselves arrested the day before the raid to make sure the prisoners knew the score. There was gonna be a jailbreak. The jailbreak to end all jailbreaks. The question was, how? The resistance forces in the area knew that a head-on assault like the one they staged at St. Quentin Prison a couple months prior would be suicidal with all the extra troops the Gestapo had just posted there. And even if there wasn't the added security, the main reason for the resistance launching this mission was they needed to replace their losses by recruiting prisoners while also rescuing their senior leaders. The amount of firepower required to breach the walls, overpower the garrison, and rescue the high value targets was well beyond the capability of available manpower, let alone firepower. And even if they had the gear to do it with, which, unless the local panzer division on leave from Russia was willing to lend it to them, that wasn't going to happen. They had no idea at the time, though, that Allied intelligence was already way ahead of them on that score, and they had a plan of action. They informed the French resistance to prepare round-the-clock surveillance of the prison, along with as many fighters and as much transport as they could muster. Trucks and cars began filling the backyards and side roads, while arms caches were built up both for the resistance assault force and for the prisoners to grab on their way out. Britain's special operations executive dropped in large amounts of arms and ammunition while fake documents and civilian clothes were prepared for those making the getaway. They even managed to convert a French prison warden into a friendly agent, who, with the aid of one of the inmates, copied the master key for the whole complex, meaning that the assault team could access and destroy all of the prison admin and records. All they needed now was a way to breach the wall and destroy the garrison. Enter the Anzacs, or more accurately, the Royal Australian and Royal New Zealand Air Forces. For you see. As per usual, when the British High Command found out there was an incredibly dangerous mission with dubious chances of success, which could be very costly, not to mention very, very embarrassing if it goes wrong, they did what the British always do. Send in the Colonials first. If they fail and die... Oh dear, how sad, never mind. <laughs> and if they succeed, we get to take all the credit. And before you ask or complain in the comments, yes, we are still mad about Gallipoli. However, in fairness, actually, they uh, needed experts on busting people out of prison. So in this case, uh, it actually makes sense to send the Aussies and the Kiwis, given the circumstances. I get... Shut up, we're still mad. Uh, anyway, prison break. On topic, right. Prison break. Operation Jericho. Yeah, go. So, with the experiences in the North African campaign of the Desert Air Force, as well as being on the receiving end of the Luftwaffe in 1940, the Allies had been developing a dedicated interdiction and close air support capability, which took the form of Second Tactical Air Force. These pilots specialized in cooperating with Allied ground forces and operating at low level close to the front line. They were relatively untested, but during the upcoming invasion of Normandy, they were going to become the single most vital asset the Allies would have access to. 
However, whenever you build a new force, you need a cadre of experienced units to anchor all of the new units around, and so the RAF had transferred two of its best fast attack bomber squadrons equipped with the de Havilland Mosquito. 487 Squadron Royal New Zealand Air Force and 464 Squadron Royal Australian Air Force, who had been flying low-level precision strike operations on occupied Europe since 1942, with both squadrons taking part in Operation Oyster, a devastating low-level precision raid on the Philips Electronics Factory complex in the Dutch city of Eindhoven, which was so successful it shut down nearly a third of the Germans' production of vacuum tubes and associated components, vital for communications and radar equipment. It was this success, and the subsequent results, which got them earmarked for the upcoming operation codenamed Ramrod 564, along with the British 21 Squadron RAF, who were also veterans of that raid. A total of 18 Mosquitoes, 6 from each squadron, were designated for the operation. They would be armed with 4 500 pound bombs each, 2 armor piercing and 2 high explosive, the idea being that the first two bombs would blast a hole before the two high explosives shatter the walls or the building and shake the masonry of the target. The plan was, despite all appearances, rather straightforward in design, while being very difficult in execution. One squadron of bombers would breach the walls, while another destroyed the guardhouse and the guards' quarters, timing the attack for midday so they would be all having lunch or on break. Once this is done, the prisoners would overpower their guards in the confusion and make a break for the hole in the perimeter, aided by the resistance assault force who would be coming the other way, killing the surviving guards and destroying the prison's records and infrastructure, busting anyone out still locked up in the process. But wait, Pac-Man, I hear you ask. That math doesn't check. There are three squadrons on the mission, but you've only mentioned two. And that's because the third squadron, the Brits of number 21 squadron, had a much grimmer job. As mentioned before, the OSS and MI6, the intelligence organizations behind this whole caper, made it absolutely clear that the information held by the inmates must not, under any circumstances, be made known to the Germans. And in keeping with standard imperial procedure, if throwing the colonials at it doesn't work, you must enact exterminatus. Should the Anzacs fail, 21 Squadron was to expend all of their ordnance on the prison complex, both bombs and guns. They were to drop and shoot everything, killing everyone inside the compound. Not one of the high-value targets could be allowed to survive. And as horrific as that sounds, it was definitely the right decision should the initial strike fail. However, as the commanding officer of the Kiwis, Wing Commander Irving Smith, said in an interview after the war, when they found out that their mission was to rescue their allies facing torture and execution at the hands of the Gestapo, they were so resolute and determined that should they run out of bombs trying to breach the walls, they'd ram them with their aircraft and ensure they broke. Failure to them was unthinkable. And so the resistance maintained their vigil, preparing for a daring rescue while the pilots prepared themselves for the task by studying a scale model of the target over and over again. They'd only get one shot at this, so they had to make it count. And as the sound of the mechanic's tools fell silent, and the lights in the hangar workshops went out, the mosquitoes of 140 Wing 2nd Tactical Air Force stood menacingly, waiting for the dawn. February 18th, 1944 dawned with horrific weather over England. The sky around Amiens was cloudy and overcast, but there was no precipitation and so conditions were permissible for bombing. Alas, at the 11th hour, the problem wasn't the mission itself, but getting to the mission area. But this mission was so critical to the war effort and the crews so dedicated to its success that it didn't matter what the conditions were. They were going to fly. The only problem was, due to security concerns and mission planning procedure, they still actually hadn't decided who was going to blow the walls and who was going to hit the guardhouses. So the Anzacs resolved the problem how they always do. Via gambling. The two commanding officers flipped a coin. It came up heads. The Kiwis would blow the wall. With that piece of business completed, the crews mounted up, and as the clock struck 11am, they took off one by one into a severe snowstorm 
with their rally point being the Channel Coast. They met up with their fighter escort halfway across the channel, a wing of Hawker Typhoons who had to shepherd the bombers back together after they had gotten separated in the blizzard. Four of the Mosquitoes had to return to base due to damage suffered in the bad weather or having been disoriented and thrown off course out of mission parameters, while the remaining 14 Mosquitoes grouped up in their respective flights and flew to the objective just above the waves, under the German radar screen. The prisoners at lunch had been tipped off by new arrivals, planted by the resistance, that there was going to be a breakout attempt, and that as soon as they heard an air raid siren or aircraft noise, they were to immediately hit the floor. All resistance forces now alerted to the operation were on standby outside the prison, ready to launch. As it always happens in war, it was now in the hands of the men at the front who would decide the outcome. The commander of 21 Squadron, Percy Picard, who had become famous as the star of an RAF propaganda film, F for Freddy, led the Mosquitoes into the attack, flying low over the French coast through an intense barrage of anti-aircraft fire. The lookouts on the coastal flak batteries immediately telephoned their local fighter unit, Jagdgeschwader 26, alerting them of the incoming bombers in the region. Two Focke-Wulf 190s, flown by Feldwebel Meyer and Leutnant Redner, scrambled from their airfield and were actually sighted taxiing to the runway for takeoff by the photo reconnaissance mosquito which had been sent along to capture the whole raid on film. At 12.01, exactly on time, the raiding force reached the target and began their run. The Kiwis went in first, with one flight heading towards the eastern wall and the other lining up on the northern one. The Aussies, who had been following too close behind, broke off to avoid getting caught in the initial blasts of the bombs and began a circuit to line up on their targets on each end of the main prison building. The Mosquitoes came in low, so low in fact that their propellers were spraying snow off the ground behind them as they went, dodging in between trees and buildings until finally the prison came into view. The aggressive Aeotearons released their bombs at near point-blank range, skipping them across the ground into the walls. Some even punched straight through and detonated in the courtyard, damaging the buildings while the impacts shook their cell doors open. But the Kiwis had succeeded, blowing holes in the northern and eastern walls as they pulled off violently at full throttle to get out of the blast zone. The Aussies were right behind them. Coming in at full speed, they released their bombs in two consecutive volleys, scoring direct hits on both the guardhouses and blasting the side of the main prison building open. Around 50 of the guards were killed, while the remainder were either wounded or left shell-shocked. A number of prisoners had been killed in the blasts, but the majority, having heard the raid approaching, had taken cover, and now they saw their opportunity to make a break for it. Of the 800 prisoners incarcerated, around 350 of them made a beeline for the gaps in the wall as the resistance fighters poured into the breach to meet them. But unfortunately, due to the escape being suspected prior to the operation, after their operative had been captured, the enlarged garrison of troops stationed in the prison had enough men to reorganize and counterattack after the escapees. A firefight broke out between the resistance and the Germans, forcing the resistance fighters back out of the building, with 37 prisoners being gunned down by the machine gun nest as they ran. Circling over the prison, Squadron Leader Picard, seeing that the prisoners were making good their escape, signalled the Mosquitoes of 21 Squadron to break off, as they were no longer needed to level the prison. Instead, he ordered his flight to blow up the nearby railway station to prevent the Germans from dispatching reinforcements, which they duly did, buying much needed time for the extraction teams to rush the escaped prisoners out of the area. The time was now 12.06. The entire operation had taken five minutes. Given that the conditions were poor and that the resistance were in such close proximity, the remaining Allied aircraft couldn't risk doing gun runs or dropping their remaining bombs to support them. Not to mention that the entirety of the Luftwaffe in France would now be rushing to their fighters. The mission complete, the Mosquitoes began their return to base, with Picard staying on rear guard with the escorting Typhoons in order to do a battle damage assessment. It would be a fatal mistake. While he and his observer were looking down at the prison, Feldwebel Meyer in his focke 190 had spotted their aircraft and moved into position. As Picard began his flight home, Meyer dove in from his intercept course and fired, cutting off their tail. They were far too low to bail out and crashed in a ball of flame. His flight lead, Leutnant Radner, had at the same time sighted the escorting typhoons and damaged one severely enough to force the pilot to crash land. The rest of the raiders sped away at low altitude, 
taking some aircrew casualties to anti-aircraft fire and another Fokker Wolf, but managing to bring their aircraft back home to England. And thus ended Operation Ramrod 564. Or had it ended? The escape itself appeared to have been a fantastic success, but due to the aggressiveness of the German response and their preparedness, of the 258 men who managed to escape, 182 were recaptured in the coming weeks. But the senior leaders had managed to make good their escape, and thus the damage had been done while averting the crisis. They were able to identify the informants and the spies in the resistance who sold them out to the Gestapo, resulting in over 60 Gestapo and Abwehr agents being identified and dealt with. 102 prisoners had died in the attack due to either the bombing or German machine guns, while six air crew were lost, four killed in action and two prisoners of war. But to this day, there are still a number of mysteries around the mission, and a large number of details are still highly classified. Which begs the question, why? Especially given its propaganda value. For example, several of the senior resistance leaders, as well as the spies, while they were rescued, were never seen or heard from again. Including Raymond Vivant, he just disappeared. Furthermore, not everyone escaped, which means there would still have been a large number of people in the prison posing a security risk. If so, why didn't the Allies still level the building? The truth is, we will probably never know. But I have a couple of hunches. First, the people they managed to extract were key organizers to the resistance and getting them out would increase resistance activity prior to the invasion. Recruitment will of course go up as well and it will be easier given the propaganda value of the raid. The allies will look after their friends and save France and so on. Next, the people they were rescuing were providing actionable intelligence for Operation Crossbow, the locating and destroying of V1 and V2 launch sites and support facilities. The Allies knew about their plans, and despite them not having been launched yet, they knew where they were, roughly. So they needed eyes on the ground to gather intel for them. And finally, there was Operation Fortitude, part of Project Double Cross. The entire Allied intelligence network at this time was making every effort to fool the Germans into thinking that Calais and Norway were their primary targets for the liberation of Europe, not Normandy. What better way to convince the Oberkommando de Wehrmacht that Calais was their target when they attempted a rescue on the very people you'd need to conduct vital sabotage behind the beaches in support of an invasion? The Germans knew they had caught some very big fish in the resistance, and the Allies knew that the Germans knew. I mean, how would it look to you if you captured some high-ranking people and then all of a sudden, the best pilots in the enemy air force roll up and attack the prison they are being held in? They must have information you absolutely must not know. And knowing that the resistance likes to operate in a very decentralized manner, that must mean that vital intelligence relates to local operations here. Which, given the intelligence they had been receiving from their network of spies in England, also known as the other elements of Double Cross, as they were all either double agents for the British or completely fictional intelligence sources made up by MI6, and the build-up of military forces they observed in the channel ports around Dover, all of which were fake, inflatable tanks, inflatable aircraft, wooden ships and barges made to look real on aerial photographs, and as far as the Germans knew, with the accurate reports they had gotten from the United States regarding their industrial might, these were all very, very real. Plus, there is one more thing. One of the bombs hit the prison. It hit the side of the prison. Square on. You can see the damage in this photograph. I'm willing to place money that that part of the prison is where the HVTs were kept. And the reason why we haven't heard from them is because that part of the prison was intentionally targeted by the RAF and so they decided to kill them anyway. That's at least my theory. There's a little pet theory of mine anyway. In any case, it doesn't really matter in regards to this video. All that matters is one simple fact. Operation Jericho was without a doubt history's greatest jailbreak.